Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Welcome to the Noir Preserve and our ceremony, Ribbons of Remembrance. Would you please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Westchester County Department of Public Safety Ceremonial Unit. May I ask State Senator Shelley Mayer and Westchester County Legislator Ruth Walter to come to the microphone and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Present. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again to the Westchester County Department of Public Safety Ceremonial Unit. I'd like to ask the Reverend Troy DeCohen, Senior Pastor at the Mount Vernon Heights Congregational Church, who's also co-chair of the Interfaith Clergy for Social Action and president of the United Black Clergy, to join us for an opening prayer. Reverend DeCohen. I thank you, uh, County Exec uh, George Lattimore, for uh, the introduction. Uh, but before, before I, I pray, notice the ribbons behind us, and this is the ribbons of remembrance of all of those that have uh, passed as a result of COVID-19. Um, our hearts go out to you. And in a commentary, I would just like to mention you know, one of the saddest things as a pastor uh, that I have witnessed as a result of COVID-19 uh, and the deadliness of this disease was for the many men and women that died. And the sad thing is they died alone. Many men and women in the beginning of the pandemic uh, family members were not allowed in the hospital rooms with their loved ones. And so many people uh, have passed away by themselves that could not even hold the hand of their loved one. Uh, my heart is broken and our hearts go out to all of the deceased uh, that have transitioned uh, into the other world uh, but left this world alone. Uh, so we want to pray for those who have lost their lives for the, from COVID-19 and then from all of the others, the frontline workers uh, and the many men and women uh, that combat this uh, every day. So Father God, creator of all, we pray in the memories of them that have transitioned this world, that have lost their life to COVID-19, the coronavirus, and who have transitioned alone without the touch, the comfort of their loved one. We pray for their peace right now. 
We pray for the families that have grieved the loss of their loved ones, uh, that have not had the opportunity even to funeralize, not even to pay final respects. We pray for them and their comfort and a peace that surpasses all understanding upon them. We pray for our frontline workers, for those who are protecting us right now, uh, for all of the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare workers, our police and firefighters, uh, those that work in the homeless service uh, industry, uh, bus drivers, train operators, for the many men and women that are risking their life each and every day so that they can provide a service unto, the, unto us. We pray for them. We pray for protection and covering upon them. We pray for the cure and the end of this deadly disease and that we can recover as people and learn a lesson that we are all in this together and that when one suffers, we all suffer. So we pray for your covering and we ask for your blessing and we thank you for this day and for the privilege to lift up the many men and women who have lost their lives to this disease. We lift them up in prayer and for that peace to be upon them. And we all say, Amen. Thank you, Reverend DeCohen. As we continue our attitude of prayer, we would uh, ask Imam Kwari Amjad Karim of the Westchester Muslim Center to share his thoughts in prayer with us today. Imam. Good afternoon, everyone. God Almighty has says in the Quran, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ أَلَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, Allah, God Almighty, tells us in the Quran, we will certainly test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give glad tidings, give good news to those who patiently persevere. Those who, when face a disaster and say, surely to God we belong and to Him we shall return. We are gathered here today to honor our loved ones who have lost their lives in this time of tragedy and suffering. We mourn their passing deeply and know that while there are no words for the suffering we have endured as a community. We seek to honor the lives of these members of our community whom we have lost and to remember their lives. Let us pray in solidarity for our brothers and sisters here and around the world who are sick. Let us pray for those who have lost loved ones to this virus. May God console them and grant them peace. O oh God, be with those who have died from coronavirus. They are our beloved mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters and children and they are our beloved fellow Americans. To those who have lost loved ones, we, your fellow citizens, offer you comfort, condolences, and empathy. As a people, we have borne this pandemic's cost in the lives of our families. As a community, we shall honor and mourn, th mourn them together. O oh God, heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from walking, working together and neighbors from helping one another. 
O oh God, we pray also for our frontliners, the doctors, nurses, and caregivers, and for the public health officials, and all of our civic leaders who seek to heal and help those affected, and who put themselves at risk in the process. O oh God, be with our local leadership, especially our county executive George Latimer and his administration. May God grant them courage and prudence as they seek to respond to this emergency with compassion and in service to the common, go common good. May God protect us all. Amen. Thank you very much, Imam. You may be seated. We're here on this uh, windswept day to uh, honor those that we've lost because of the COVID epidemic that has had us in our grips since March, uh, and also to recognize the changing of the seasons so that we continue to uh, create a place of honor uh, in an environment that can be enjoyed during the difficult winter months. We have uh, some uh, opportunity here today to share some thoughts by some of the individuals deeply involved in this effort and so I'd like to first call upon the chairman of the Westchester County Board of Legislators, who uh, has been a partner in all matters relating to public policy. Uh, we're honored to have him, one of his colleague legislators, Ruth Walter, with us, but most importantly to have him here to share his thoughts on this day, the Honorable Chairman of the Board of Legislators, Ben Boykin. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, County Executive Latimer, my partner in government. To the spiritual leaders, thank you for those uplifting words which we need. And as has been mentioned, I'm pleased to have been joined today by legislator Ruth Walters. For all of us, not just those of us in public life, but each and every person in Westchester and around the world, 2020 has been a year of grievous loss loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of opportunity, loss of time. But for each Westchester resident who has come to this memorial to hang a ribbon, as you see over my back, that loss has been incalculable. Each ribbon here represents a loved one, a mother, a father, a child, a sibling, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, cousin, a friend some cherished person whose life was cut short by COVID-19. Even in these dark days, as we find ourselves in the throes of a steepening crisis, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Vaccines are on the way, a better day is ahead. This pandemic will pass. But for anyone who hung a ribbon here and everyone else who is grieving a loved one lost to COVID, there's a hole that will always remain forever. And I think the latest numbers are for Westchester, over 1,512 individuals have lost their lives. So we must remember, and we commit ourselves to always remember. That's why we're moving this memorial to a place where it will now be protected. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us into isolation even as we gather today with social distance, not so much for shaking hands or hugging each other. But as we look at this ribbon, and as everyone now who comes into the county office building will see them, we have a way to grieve and remember, not in isolation, but together. And let's go a step further. Let's honor the members of each of these individuals by taking action by continuing to provide for those who continue to suffer from hunger, from the threat of homelessness, from loss of jobs, from closed businesses, our first responders, our health care workers, our teachers, those who care for those who are invalid at home, those who work in our nursing facilities. And let's make sure that we do the right thing, wear our mask, flatten the curve, and hold on just a little bit longer until the day comes when we do not need to hang another ribbon. We will always cherish the memory of those that we have lost. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Chairman Boykin. We appreciate those solemn words and your leadership on our behalf. This uh, setting uh, is under the care of the Parks, Recreation, and Conservation Department of Westchester County. And uh, the idea to create a, a place of remembrance was not necessarily one that um, uh, came from me or senior management directly, but was a combination of parks management and our communications team talking about what would be a fitting way to remember those that we were losing. And if you go back to that period of time of March, uh, we started to lose people uh, in an incredible number for a civilian uh, peacetime loss of life. So I'd like to ask some of the people that were involved in uh, the creation of this remembrance uh, to join us here and share their thoughts. First, the Commissioner of the Parks, Recreation, Conservation Department, the Honorable Kathy O'Connor. Madam Commissioner. Good afternoon. Thank you, County Executive Latimer. When the idea was being developed through all the people, all the, all the agencies that the County Executive alluded to, communications, the Parks Department, the administration, uh, we were honored when it was decided to do Ribbons of Remembrance here at Lenoir Preserve. As you can see, and we couldn't have a more beautiful afternoon in December, this is a very fitting place to house this project, and it has given such solace to the people that, as other people have mentioned, unlike other uh, scenarios, people have died alone without their people, their, their friends and family around them. So we obviously wanted to give them a spot where they could remember the people that have passed and sit here and contemplate. Behind us is, of course, the Hudson River. It doesn't get any more beautiful than the setting that we have right here. So we were honored that Lenoir was picked, and I would like to just say thank you to our conservation division, headed up by Jason Klein, the director, and then the uh, curator who runs this fabulous facility is Sarah Cavanaugh. So I'd like to thank all of them, and as always, our deputy, our first deputy commissioner, Peter Tataglia, who also had a tremendous hand in doing this. So thank you for allowing us to share this uh, initiative here in one of our facilities, and COVID has changed the lives of all of us and probably forever. So the County Parks Department is desperately trying to keep positive and to provide positive outlets for people that are going through very difficult times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. We've been joined by another member of our Westchester County Board of Legislators, the Honorable Vadat Gashi. Legislator, thank you for being with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to uh, have uh, my partner in government, the Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins, share a few of his thoughts on this day. Uh, this is an area of Yonkers that he knows very well, having represented it uh, in public office, living not that far from this area. He's been here many times before, now as part of the executive team. This is part of what we hope will be uh, a future legacy to improve on us. Mr. Jenkins. Thank you, County Executive. Um, as as we, we sit here and today at the Lenoir Preserve in our award-winning county park system, and keeping around in mind all of the individuals that we have lost in Westchester as has been said that has not had the opportunity to have the proper reflection and to be able to to mourn as much as we would like to as we would have done pre-COVID. This ribbons of remembrance and this memorial is a tribute to all of those every person that we have lost and whether that person was a frontline worker, one of our medical professionals, the support staff in the medical profession, our first responders, our fire, police, our EMS, all of the essential workers, that are too many to name, that we all of a sudden found out were essential workers to make sure that all of us can protect ourselves as best as possible. At this moment in time, it's a great opportunity for us to Remember how we can all get through this together because the ribbons of remembrance are a tie for all of us to buy. So at this point in time, it is a pleasure to be here today with all of my colleagues in government, certainly County Executive Latimer, and all of the folks that have thought about 
this kind of remembrance and the kind of empathy that we should be showing to each and every person that is here, not just in Westchester County and around the country. We need to continue to stay vigilant even as we're fatigued beyond belief, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. So we all need to continue to stay strong and stay together, but more importantly, we cannot forget any one of the members of our great county or our great country or around the world that's been lost to this devastating disease. So let's all continue to work together to make sure that we get through this. Thank you. Before we close, I'll share a few thoughts that I think are probably the thoughts that we all have standing here on this field, uh, looking out over the Hudson River, the Palisades, and the mountains across the river in New Jersey, Rockland, wherever we are on that portion of it. It strikes you that there are things that are ephemeral and things that are eternal. And when you look at the beautiful piece of land here, aside from the fact that there's been a mansion here for 100 years or so, and we've paved some land here, but we basically have land that looks the way it must have looked hundreds of years ago. And not just before Europeans walked on this, on this continent, but long before that. And that beautiful river and those mountains and the sky above it, those were created by some force and power greater than we are, greater than government, greater than the, uh, the collected efforts of humanity. Those things are eternal. They survive. People 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that are not alive today, stood where we stand now and saw that land and saw that river, saw the mountains and saw the sky. So when we come here today, we're accepting that there is an ephemeral nature to life, that we are all here for a certain period of time allotted by our maker. And that time is different for each of us. And the time frame of when we leave is his alone to determine. We know that um, there are tragedies of all sort that cut short what we think of as the natural period of life. I had the opportunity a number of years ago to be in Memphis, Tennessee. And for those of you who have ever been in Memphis, Tennessee, it's a very lively city, Mississippi City. Beale Street has got uh, jazz clubs, music clubs that go on all hours of the night, sort of like a Bourbon Street environment. You have um, Graceland, where Elvis Presley uh, had his homestead just over the, the border from downtown. Uh, the, the little ducks marched through the Peabody Hotel, which is a special signature of that hotel in Memphis. And they have, on the site of the Lorraine Motel, a National Civil Rights Museum that has been created. And the Lorraine Motel, you may remember, was the site where Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in April of 1968. And as I walked through with a colleague, the Civil Rights Museum, we traced all the different steps of the Civil Rights Movement, and not necessarily in the order that I remember them, but the Freedom Riders who rode the Greyhound buses, the, the Greensboro counter-protests, people who sat peacefully at the counters and were, were mauled for the sake of doing that. There was Rosa Parks in the, in, in the, bus, in the Montgomery bus uh, boycott, and then the horror of what happened to Viola Liuzzo or three workers uh, in rural Mississippi. And the museum itself works up on an angle and it basically ends in the room next to the room that Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy were in that night. And you can walk out onto the, uh, the balcony next to where Dr. King walked out onto the balcony. And it's at that location that he faced eternity. Did not even live to be 40 years old was not even 40 years old that night. And of course, as I talked about that experience, uh, and then coming back and coming back home and talking to friends, a friend of mine said something very wise to me. He said, to, said, as much as this moved you by seeing this, do not focus on the place of death, focus on the life. Focus on the life of Dr. King. And over my lifetime, I have stood in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, Texas. Don't focus on the point of death. Remember the life that was lived prior to that. We think about that when we look at the 9-11 the monument in New York City. 
We remember what the towers looked like, and now they're part of our memory where 3,000 people lost their lives. 1,500 people are a lot of people. And to imagine 1,500 people in one space, you're at, a, uh, you're at an event in the Westchester County Center, basketball tournament. The, the uh, crowds are filled on the upper deck and there's, there's ground level seating. And you hear, and Kathy would have heard this, and Peter would have heard this, 1,500 people in the arena tonight. And you look at that mass of humanity. Maybe it's a graduation for one of the colleges. Tomorrow we're going to be uh, at the graduation of a class of uh, police academy uh, individuals who are graduating now to take on the responsibility. The hall will be filled with people. And it's sobering to think that a year ago as we approached the, uh, the holidays, Christmas holidays for those of us Christian, Hanukkah celebration for those Jewish, other times of the year, that those 1,500 people were just as alive as we are today. Some of them may have been older in years, they may have been ill already, sick in some ways, but some of them weren't. Some of them were perfectly healthy. And they celebrated New Year's Eve just like you and I celebrated New Year's Eve in whatever context that was. And they toasted to the new year 2020 with hopes and expectations. They were with us during Valentine's Day. But beginning about March 1st, we started to lose them. And now, with the fatalities just of last night, we are well over 1,500 Westchester residents and over 270,000 Americans, and worldwide a larger number than that. So, as Lincoln said at Gettysburg, what do we do to hollow ground? We have three men of the clergy. You've heard from the Imam and Reverend Cohen. You'll hear shortly from Rabbi Hoffman. These are men who've devoted their lives to helping us as secular people find that connection to spirituality that helps us get through a moment like this because it is beyond our capability as humans to grasp what is greater than us and that we have to accept that we are here for a short period of time. The short period of time could be 20 years, it could be 120 years, but the day comes where we go. And to see people that we love die in a context of a pandemic is in some ways harder than any other way because what took their lives was not visible to us. It was everywhere and it was nowhere and it's still there. It's still here. That's why we wear a mask. That's why the normal way we greet each other with a hug and a handshake disappears because of social distancing where we sanitize our hands so much, I don't really worry about the context, the way my hands feel. Some people want their hands smooth. Whatever it is, we do what we have to do, not only for us to survive, but for the people that we interact with to survive. And unfortunately, we have a monument to the fact that over 1,500 people did not survive. But with every COVID update that I give, certainly the governor gives, president, we talk about numbers, rates of infection. We talk about how many people are hospitalized. What is the rate of hospitalization? What are we going to do in the red zone and the yellow zone and the orange zone? How are we going to open schools? How are we going to close them? What are we going to test? What kind of test? 1,500 people were alive on Valentine's Day that are not alive today. And on Valentine's Day, Somebody said to them, I love you. Grandpa, I love you, honey. I love you, my son, my daughter. And they're gone. And what do we do? Imperfect people that we are, we create a remembrance. We try to remember with cloth and magic marker attached to a piece of wood that they lived. And we know that they lived. And we love that they lived, and the vast majority of these people I did not know personally. But it doesn't matter. They lived. They were our neighbors. They were our friends. They're gone. And they're not coming back. One of the people that died very early in the process, I spoke of him before, was a gentleman named Glenn Belito. 
Glenn Belito is an East Chester town councilman. He happened to be of the other political party than the one I'm in. We knew each other well. We had the same dentist. We would sit in the dentist room before social distancing, complaining about how we didn't want to go to the dentist. I want to meet the guy that wants to go to the dentist. Anybody raise your hand? No offense to dentists. Necessary uh, medical service. And in public office, we worked together on things that we could work together on. And when we disagreed, we had a jovial friendship across the aisle. Almost to the day, not quite, we stood together in the Twin Lakes section of East Chester to light the annual Christmas tree. Peter McCart was there, our friend. And Glenn and I joked, we joked how heavy both of us had become. And uh, we agreed to uh, chat at some point in time about a particular issue that involved East Chester and the county. And we said we would see each other, probably meet to get a bite to eat at the diner and talk about it. A day that never came. Glenn was afflicted by this. And in almost no time at all, he went from being sick to being gone forever. I was not his closest friend. I was a friend, an acquaintance, and we had a business connection. Every time I deliver a number in front of these cameras, I think of Glenn. I think of Frank Grandazzo. I think of Mario Nardi. I think of Fred Gallo, who was a coach for the Iona baseball team. I think of Lena Ceruzzi. I know that friends of mine have lost their spouses. And how you deal with that emotion is individual and it's difficult. We turn to our religious leaders, help us understand. They refer to scripture and they use the power of their ability to speak to the heart to try to make us feel something. And so we have created this best idea that, that we had in this place of eternal nature to remember that people lived and they died and they were loved. The winter is coming. It's a bleak scene to be here during the heart of January with the snow. It's hard to get to. You might hurt yourself on the way to here. And we don't want the wind to whip through this remembrance. So we bring it indoors. But the most important thing, even as we talk about the vaccine that's coming, the economic need to, to improve our businesses because of this pandemic, as we talk about which zone will get us there and testing in schools, is that we remember those that have died. And it is a scar to talk about COVID and not remember the people who died. It is a scar on our humanity. We can talk about vaccine delivery and talk about the people we lost. We have to remember them. We have to cling to them. They died before the vaccines could come. They died before we actually knew how to handle it. They died before we understood that we all had to wear masks. We didn't know all these things on day one. But we stand here in my judgment, as a humbled people, we have seen a force greater than us. We have seen a force that forces us to be disciplined, self-disciplined, deny us from things that we're accustomed to in our culture. I saw last night on television, a crowd of people in Staten Island and wanted to get inside a bar. I don't know. We show humbleness, we show discipline, we show reverence, and we show love. We are ephemeral human beings. That is the best we can do. And we remember. And we take a ribbon as a tangible sign of our remembrance. I'd like to ask Rabbi Evan Hoffman to join us here to give us a closing prayer. Thank you, County Executive Latimer and the Parks Department for hosting this event. I'm honored to participate. It was my Jewish community of New Rochelle that was first hit on March 1st of this year 
when everyone else was still enjoying life as normally as they could, thought they could, I was in quarantine for 14 days with my children. The day that I came out, I had my first COVID funeral on the uh, stony hills of Mount Eden in Valhalla. And instead of there being a hundred people there, there was one person, me and the deceased and the funeral workers. You know, organized religion has many great features to it. One of the most important is it helps us get through the life cycle occasions. It provides order, content, and meaning in the most challenging moments of our lives. None more significant than passing from this world to the next, to the hereafter. And as was mentioned before, the clergy could not, per, could not minister to our parishioners, to our congregants in their moment of weakness as they slipped from this life. And we couldn't do funerals the way we would have liked, in awkward fashion, on Zoom, on a hilltop, with nobody else there. What is it that we're praying for? Yes, we're praying for the doctors, the nurses, the frontline workers. I think of my father who contracted COVID as an ICU physician in the first weeks of March, but thank God he survived. Yes, we pray for those who are in danger, but we're also praying for a return to normalcy. We would like a day to come when we could go to the stadium, to the theater, to the restaurant, to the house of worship without being in trepidation that we're endangering our physical well-being and without shielding ourselves with numerous layers of protective equipment. We would like all that to happen and happen soon, and maybe with God's help it will. In the Jewish tradition, when we return the Torah scroll to the Ark on Saturday mornings on the Sabbath, as we put the sacred item in the Ark, we close with Chadesh Yamenu Kekedem, restore our days as the days of old. Probably the biblical author had in mind some time in deep in antiquity some time of great righteousness when the world was perfect. I also would like to restore our days as of old, but I don't need to return to 3,000 years ago. Let me just return to February, when life was, was good as we knew it, and before we lost so many souls. And so that is our prayer. Restore our days as of old, not the distant past, but the recent past, a world of health and a world without fear. And until that day, let us take the necessary precautions and maintain ourselves and remember those who we've lost. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. And now to close, Sergeant Mike Hagan will uh, give us the rendition of that haunting hymn, Amazing Grace. Sergeant. Thank you for being with us here today. May you and your family enjoy health and safety through the rest of the year and the year that follows. Thank you all.